Hello everyone and welcome again. So continuing our discussion about the orthopedics trauma basic principles class. Now we are going to talk about the fracture healing. Now it is important to understand fracture healing not only for your exams but also for understanding the management of fractures. It is important for understanding why we choose conservative management for some fractures and we choose operative management for other type of fractures. And this is the most simplified lecture you will find on the internet for understanding the fracture healing. And here we will talk about the requirement for a fracture healing, the bone healing types, which include the secondary bone healing, the primary bone healing, and the gap healing. And we will also talk about the factors affecting fracture healing. And we will finally talk about the average healing times of fractures. So let's start. So what are the requirements for fracture healing to occur? So th there is a three main requirements and they include that there is intact blood supply to the fractured fragments. So uh, the, the nutrients and the cells reach the fracture site and we need immobilization of the fragments by casting or any other immobilization method and we need absence of infection or prevention of infection to the fractured site. So what are the bone healing types? So we have three types of bone healing. We have the secondary bone healing. It's also the indirect or the spontaneous bone healing. And we have the primary bone healing, which is also called the contact healing. And we have the gap healing. So what is the deciding factor for the type of fracture healing to occur to a specific fracture? And the answer to this question is that the amount of tension applied to the fracture will decide the type of healing that occurred to the fracture. And if it is below, 10, below 2%, uh, meaning that there is, the fracture ends are held very stable, primary bone healing will occur. And example for that is when using plates and screws to immobilize the fracture, which is a type of internal fixation. And if the tension is between 2 to 10%, meaning that there is a little movement between the fracture ends due to external forces, secondary bone healing will occur. And that's when using a cast, intramedullary nail, or external fixation. So we will start by explaining the secondary bone healing, then we will explain the primary and the gap healing. So secondary bone healing, also called healing by callus, the bone surfaces are placed close to each other, but not in direct contact. In comparison with the primary bone healing, which occur when there is direct contact between bony surfaces. So secondary bone healing, uh, not in direct contact, the bony surfaces are not in direct contact, the primary bone healing are, uh, the bony surfaces are in direct contact. The secondary bo bone healing process is called the endochondral ossification. It's important to understand or to, rem to remember this for your exam. And it is the most common type of healing that occur to the long bones. And it occur in absence of rigid fixation. As we mentioned earlier, uh, it, the secondary bone healing occur when there is two to 10% tension between the fracture fragments. Uh, and the primary bone healing occur when there is less than 2% tension. Advantages compared to primary bone healing is that the secondary bone healing, uh, the healing the fracture is more mechanically stronger during the healing phase and with increasing stress the callus grows stronger and stronger according to Wolf's law. So secondary bone healing is on five stages. It starts up with hematoma formation, then inflammation, then soft callus formation, hard callus formation and finally remodeling into a normal bone. Uh, and we will explain each of those stages in the next slides. So the first stage of the secondary bone healing is the hematoma formation. That's when there is a bleeding that occur from the bone and soft tissue at the fracture site. Meaning when the bone breaks, there would be bleeding from the bone itself and the soft tissue, and that would lead to hematoma formation. Uh, here we have a drawing of the tibial bone. Here we have the periosteum endosteum and the bone marrow. 
and here we have a fracture which result in bleeding from the fracture site and from the other tissues that would lead to hematoma formation as explained here. So after the hematoma formation, we would have an inflammation process would start as the second stage of the secondary bone healing. So after hematoma, inflammatory process starts, cytokines are released, inflammatory cells are recruited, including neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, and T cells. Osteoclasts are also formed to remove necrotic ends of the bone, and the inflammation phase would last until fibrous tissue, cartilage, or bone formation begin, which is about a week after the fracture. And here we have a drawing of the tibial bone uh, that explains the second process of the fracture healing, which is the, the inflammation. So after the hematoma formation, we would have different cells are recruited to do in the inflammation phase. So after hematoma and inflammation, we would have the soft callus formation stage. And the callus is temporary bony material, cartilaginous material, fibrous connective tissue, and woven bone that replace the hematoma. So the callus is a mix of bony material, cartilaginous material, fibrous, and woven bone. And the woven bone is a bone tissue characterized by haphazard arrangement of collagen fibers and will be remodeled into a cortical bone in the upcoming stages. So the soft callus, if we say the soft callus term, uh, we mean soft bony material which is a collagen type 2 material, which is uh, the cartilage. So it is mainly formed by cartilage. So we mentioned here that the cast is either bony, cartilage, fibrous, or woven bone. In the soft callus stage, the callus is mostly uh, cartilage. So most of the callus is in the soft callus stage is cartilage, and it is mainly formed by cartilage secreted by mesenchymal stem cells that are gathered to uh, injury site because of the inflammation process. So the soft callus forms after two weeks post fracture and the fragments can't move freely now. They are stable in length and they can angulate. So after the soft callus formation, the fragments will be, they can't move freely and they are stable in length but they can angulate if there is enough force to make them angulate. And the stiffer the immobilization of the fracture, the less amount of callus are formed. Here we have a, a drawing of the tibial bone again, and this is the stage where the soft callus formation occur. It would replace the hematoma uh, uh, by the soft callus. So we mentioned that the soft callus is secreted from the mesenchymal stem cells. So what are they? So mesenchymal stem cells are undifferentiated stem cells and they differentiate to osteoblasts and chondroblasts. Chondroblasts would secrete cartilage, osteoblasts would secrete bone. An important source in fracture would be the periosteum, the bone marrow, and the surrounding muscles. And they are gathered during the inflammation process. So the fourth stage of the secondary bone healing is the hard callus formation. It occurs after the soft callus, uh, and we mentioned that the soft callus was mostly cartilage, and it was type 2 collagen, while the hard callus, on the other hand, is hard bony material, so it's mostly bony material, and it is woven bone, which is type 1 collagen. So it is mainly bone, and it's secreted by osteoblasts and chondroblasts. It starts after the formation of the soft callus, and ends when the fragments are firmly united by three to four months post the fracture. So it forms in the periphery of the fracture and progressively moves centrally. And here we have the drawing to explain it. So the soft callus would be replaced by the hard, ca by the hard callus at the fracture site. After the hard callus, we would have the final stage, which is the remodeling stage. That's when the woven bone is slowly replaced by lamellar bone. The medullary bone canal is continuous in this stage. Uh, in, in the previous stages, the medullary bone canal would, is, is blocked, as we can see here. But in the 
in the remodeling phase, it is finally continuous again. And it lasts from a few months to several years post fracture. And here we have the drawing to explain it. So this time the woven bone would be replaced by lamellar bone, which is uh, the cortical bone that would uh, make uh, the bone go back to the normal uh, way. Now, after we explain the secondary bone healing, now let's explain the primary bone healing, which is also called the contact healing. So that's when the bone ends are put in close contact. So the fracture ends are put in intimate contact to each other, and the distance between them is less than 0.1 millimeter. With absolute stability, we mentioned that the tension uh, should be less than 2% for the primary healing to occur. If it is higher than 2%, then secondary healing will occur. So if those two uh, rules are achieved, the distance is less than 0.1 and absolute stability, osteoclasts will form cutting cones that traverse the fracture lines. And the cones that are cut by the osteoclast will be occupied by capillaries with osteoblasts and this would lead to formation of lamellar bone from the osteons so the, the lamellar bone is formed directly without forming any type of callus so the, interme the intermediate stages are skipped there is no callus uh, formation whatsoever the lamellar bone is, for uh, form is formed directly uh, after the uh, capil after the osteoclasts cutting cones and after the capillaries occupy the newly cones with osteoblasts. Uh, and the primary bone healing process is called the cutting cone remodeling or the Haversian remodeling. It's important to remember those for, for your exam. The third type of bone healing is the gap healing. So the gap healing will occur if there is a small gaps between the fracture surfaces, the distance between them is less than one, one millimeter. So we mentioned in the primary bone healing, we need two, two rules. We need the, the gap should be less than 0.1 millimeter and there is the tension should be, uh, the tension should be less than uh, 2%. In the gap healing, on the other hand, we also need two rules. The, the, the fracture, the gap between fracture surfaces, this time is less than one millimeter. And we also need absolute stability, meaning the tension also should be less than 2% for the gap healing to occur. So gaps are invaded by new capillaries and osteoblasts, cells that form uh, uh, the woven bone, and then remodel to, lamer, to lamellar bone. In the primary bone healing, there is no woven bone. The lamellar bone is formed directly. In the gap healing, we would have the woven bone, then we would have the lamellar bone is formed. So now let's talk about the factors that affect the fracture healing, and we have many of them, including the age of the patient. So healing is faster in children, the time to heal. A fracture in children is half compared to adults. Also, the other factor is the type of the bone. If it is a cancellous bone, it would unite faster than the cortical bone. The fracture pattern also, so the spiral heals faster than transverse, and the transverse would heal faster than the commutative fractures. Uh, we also have the ischemic fracture ends, so that's due to damage to the blood supply from the trauma or fixation. This would lead to slower healing, or no healing at all. So if there is a skin fracture ends, this would lead to a slower healing. The fifth factor is soft tissue interposition between fracture ends. So when the, the, the soft tissue is between the fracture ends, this would prevent the callus from bridging the fragments and would lead to slower healing. We also have the reduction as a factor to fracture healing. That's when the good up position of the fracture ends would lead to faster healing. We also have the amount of movement at the fracture site, movement lead to callus formation, uh, according to the Wolf's law. So if there is absolute stability and compression, this would lead to primary bone healing. 
if there is relative stability leads to uh, secondary bone healing so absolute stability is when there is less than two percent tension relative stability is when the tension is between two and ten percent and excessive motion that's when the tension is higher than ten percent so higher than ten percent so excessive motion would lead to delayed healing or non-union and we will explain more factors in the next lectures uh, now let's mention some uh, healing times or average healing times of some fractures in adult patient so for the upper limb the clavicle the humerus the radius and the ulna would unite uh, uh, the average unite for them is six to eight weeks the wrist bones would unite in six to twelve weeks the hand and fingers would unite in four to six weeks for the lower limb uh, the hip femur tibia fibula would unite in six to twelve weeks the ankle bones would unite in six to eight weeks and the foot bones would unite in four to six weeks now the average healing time of fractures in pediatric patients is four to six weeks for most of fractures and here we reach the end of this video thank you guys for watching uh, if you want to support us you can by subscribing to the uh, channel and liking the videos you watch and if you want to support more you can by subscribing to the patreon link provided in the description of this video thank you for watching and see you in the next videos peace